The Black Pearl. Written by Brian Jaboin. Narrated by Sean Francis. As he stood upon the wooden ship, his mind began to drift off and his body remained perfectly still, like someone posing for a portrait. His eyes felt like they didn't know how to blink. He was captivated by the breathtaking beauty. He never saw it from this point of view. In front of him was a place filled with unending grains of golden sand, as if the whole island was made out of gold itself. Shimmering blue waters that sparkled in the presence of the sunlight encircled the island. Greenery spread all around the island, with patches of different coloured flowers that grew among the bushes occasionally. In a distant was a majestic waterfall that looked like a sheet of blue velour swishing down, its edges hemmed with whipped white lines. The water thundered down into the pool like a gigantic water spout. It was a beautiful day on the island that afternoon, until all of a sudden, bang, 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 shots fired into the sky. The boys were all gathered together on deck like a herd of sheep. There was a look of fear and confusion on all their faces. Wait, I'll go in for him, one of the boys interrupted. It was Manny Cato. He was a short, brown-skinned boy with eyes like a hawk. He had black curly hair and was rather frail. He kept gauges in his ears, the size of silver dollars, and wore a tribal necklace his mother made him out of bones. His name meant bold and good-hearted in the Arawak Indian language. He was standing up for one of his friends, who was being bullied by a member of the captain's crew. The boy had fallen ill, and they would have surely killed him if someone hadn't volunteered to take up his place. Manny Cato knew that this meant he would spend the rest of the day in the water, but he didn't care. The life he once knew was gone. Day after day, Manny Cato and the other boys just like him were forced by dreadful men to swim out into the ocean to collect pearls from the seashells deep at the bottom of the sea. The boy had an unusual gift for holding his breath. He could hold it longer and dive deeper than all of the other boys in his tribe. He came from a long line of powerful swimmers. His father was a fisherman, and so was the rest of his family. He was no stranger to the ocean. Sometimes he would let himself sink like a rock to the bottom. Things always seemed more peaceful to him underwater. He could feel the warmth of the water heated by the Caribbean sun. There wasn't a sound, just absolute quiet, and the feeling of the ocean currents drifting him back and forth gave him peace. His very captivity became his only escape. The ocean was like a beautiful prison to him. Down below he beheld the fish. It was Haim, they called them. If only he was a fish, he thought to himself. He would swim away. He often thought about escaping, but the pirates were quick to shoot runaways. They stood up above on board with their rifles pointed at the surface. Shoot the bastards if they start feeling lucky, they shouted. Captain's orders. There wasn't any other options left for the boys. It was either work or die. As he began running out of air, he looked over and saw a large rock. Curiously, he had reached his hand underneath it, and pulled out a rather dull-looking oyster shell. Making his way back to the surface, he could hear the pirates shouting, Over here, boy! Quit your lollygagging! Hurry it up! It was the captain. He was a tall man who stood with a hunch. He had one eye covered with a black patch, and he often smiled with a lopsided grin. His nose was hooked just as the red macaw that sat on his shoulders, and he walked with a limp. He was armed to the teeth with daggers and pistols, and dressed all in black. He wore a whole host of charms and trinkets around his neck, that he believed to bring good luck. He never shaved, but kept a long grey bushy beard. He looked like a ramshackle beggar, or a useless drunk. But even the other pirates feared him. His reputation preceded him. He would make his men richer than their wildest dreams but if they questioned an order, they would die a painful and public death. The captain and two members of his crew stood in a small boat out on the sea. Every shell had to be brought in first for inspection by the captain. Hurry it up! He shouted again. I don't have all day. Let's see what you got. The pirate gripped his sword with only three fingers and his thumb. Then snatching the shell from the boy, he turned it on its side and slid the blade into it, splitting it open. Ah, there it is, he said greedily. Wait a minute, what's this? 